European countries of North Africa and Arabian Peninsula has been considered Oriental countries as well as China and India since the origins of the concept of Orientalism according to the definition of the Orient reconstructed by Edouard Said in his renowned text Orientalism in 1978. Uh, this Orient does meld together different Mediterranean cultures, Italian and Middle Eastern widely understood, as well as Asian cultures. Uh, in Italian silent cinema, Orientalism constituted a long-lived leitmotif uh, through dance performances of uh, choreographic modernism. Therefore, the various cultures included in this concept were conveyed on the cinematic screen through dance steps. In fact, dance has been a recurring subject of silent cinema, which, for obvious reasons, insists more on the physical interpretation than on the verbal one. On the other hand, dance, at the turn of the 19th century, lived a moment uh, um, of deep renovation, strongly influenced by the widespread fascination of the, Orient for, of the Occident for the Orient. Uh, this need of regeneration concerned modern ballet as well as modern dance, which was born in those years. So academic dance renovation on one side and on the other side, the modern dance uh, um, strictly intended. At the end of 19th century, the widespread attraction for the Orient also overwhelmed the Western art of dancing, at that time crossed by a strong innovative drive. From Sergei de Avgilev's uh, Ballet uh, think about the Ballet Sherazade, uh, you can see um, uh, the Playbill, uh, whose first uh, representation was held in Paris in 1910, to modern dance pioneers such as Loya Fuller, Roussin Dennis, and Isadora Duncan, uh, the Orientalist awesomeness is a constant, variously declined. In fact, the serpentine dance created by Loya Fuller uh, and portrayed in various movies of early cinema, showing one of her countless imitators. Um, most of films are uh, the majority, al almost every film uh, with serpentine dance are with an imitator, not the real uh, Loya Fuller. At last was the revisiting of the renowned uh, was the revisiting of the renowned veil dance performed by Salome, and uh, that Oscar Wilde's drama in 1893 brought in the spotlight. Uh, moreover, Fuller also created two shows focused on Salome's character in 1895 and 1907, alternating between some variants of serpentine dance and pantomime sequences. Um, Ruth and Dennis, for her show Rada, Dance of Five Senses, um, which she created uh, and showed for the first time in 1906, staged the story of an Indian <laughs> goddess, and she was in Paris in 1900 when some oriental dances were publicly presented by the Javanese delegations, the Siamese and the Japanese one, during the same Universal Exposition, where desire for exoticism was spread to the extent that even the academic dancer Cleo de Merod uh, had to perform a series of Cambodian dances. For Isadora Duncan, instead, the Orient coincided with Antique Greece. In fact, her idea of a new dance style, free and natural, was inspired by the choreographic concept and the ideal of harmony portrayed on the ancient Greece bas relief. Uh, thus bringing back the choreographic exoticism within the Mediterranean coast. So, about Salome, um, there is a kind of a Salomania, as uh, uh, Elizabeth Kendall uh, called it, um, and uh, uh, cinema was, uh, was part of this Salomania in some, in some way. Um, simply reading titles and plots of Italian silent movies, so the period of time is 1905-1931, uh, uh, because Italy starts producing fiction movies uh, uh, 10 years later, the birth of cinema. Uh, there are countless pictures uh, where dance plays a significant role in various ways, sometimes integrated into the narrative, sometimes not. <laughs> and a large amount of these movies involve Orientalist choreographies. One of the most significant uh, examples of this uh, vogue is uh, Salome, directed by Ugo Falena, director uh, of the film d'arte italiana, a, a kind of son of the French pâté. Um, the production company which produced the movie in 1910. The performer of the Seven Veil Dance was Vittorina Lepanto, 
um, the actress Vittorina Lepanto, as a robust Salome, as you can see from the picture, <laughs> um, who danced barefoot, uh, an imaginative uh, mixture of ballet steps, such as tendu, développé, arabesque, uh, and just use of modern uh, dances flourishing out at that time, mainly under the sign of the Orientalism. Um, this characteristic was conveyed by the twisting of the torso, a recurring motif of the serpentine dance, by exasperating the movement of the hips and by a uh, lithe, uh, flexuous gestural expressiveness intended to evoke uh, uh, the sinuous lines of the oriental architecture by exaggerating the cambrai, it, it is the backward bending of the torso in, in ballet terms, and using the proverbial seven veils. So uh, now I want to show you the dance so that you can see what I'm talking about. This is just the seven veil dance of the movie. So the, the color you can see is the technique of um, the color is uh, um, coloration à pochoir, which means it's a kind of stencil technique. Um, there were, these are uh, Salem movies of Italian cinema, so it means that if you don't have the cue sheets, you don't know actually which kind of music they played during uh, the screening. Perhaps there was also some music on the set during, uh, the, um, um, during the, the shooting of the movie, but um, actually about this movie I didn't find, uh, and also other scholars didn't find anything, so it's a mystery. <laughs> And uh, um, so the dance finished by a series of turns on herself, not really pirouette, accomplished by Vittorina Lepanto on both her feet instead of one, as it happens in a canonical pirouette, and vertically accelerating the rhythm to the extent that she eventually fell on the ground exhausted as a delirious bacanti. So um, this is uh, the, the kind of urtext, we could call it, uh, of, of the seven veil dance in Italian silent cinema and all the uh, veil dances in Italian silent cinema. Um, uh, this movie, Il Fiore del Deserto, which is particularly uh, um, amazing, <laughs> I mean, it, it has a really uh, fascinating um, images. Um, so it's, it's the story about uh, um, uh, a dancer who, uh, to save uh, his, uh, his beloved man, um, uh, she sacrifices herself in some way. So um, for Salome's dance, the geographic area in interested is Jadia, uh, thus within the so-called Middle East. But there are also some choreographic elements which symptomatically returns also in the movie Il Fiore del Deserto, where the exoticism is slightly different and elusive. Presumably set in an Arab country and therefore once again within the Middle East, the movie contains two different dance scenes, but these are considerably different from each other. Uh, in the first dance, we find uh, once again a veil and a kind of turn of the dancer on herself accomplished on both feet, which is uh, quite similar to the one played by Lepanto and Salome. Evidently, this was uh, considered a kind of uh, uh, stereotype of the Orientalist dance at that time, since it recalls in several movies of Italian silent cinema involving an Oriental choreography, and it is often accompanied by the presence of a veil. In this movie, Gianna Terribili Gonzalez, the actress, uh, alias Lame, dances, uh, uh, Lame, the dancer protagonist, uh, the main character of the film, dances wearing an Oriental costume uh, which, uh, with uh, uh, white trousers uh, tied below the knees, similar to the other model proposed by Paul Poiret for the Paris fashion of 1911. The scene, yellow tinted, uh, this time is the, the film probably um, is a, a mixture of uh, tinting and toning, which were the two main uh, color techniques of the time. Similar to the iron model, um, those, I'm sorry, uh, the scene, yellow tinted, has been recorded by a single establishing shot taken from the front, and it takes place within the Bedouin camp where Lame dances for the Emir. So, um, actually, the dancer pivots on her left foot while she beats the ground with the right foot in order to accomplish the her turn. So, here we find the same uh, choreographic element, just um, performed slightly differently, and uh, um, I want to show you this uh, scene too, so you can see what I'm talking about. 
This is the first dance scene of the movie. So she comes to the foreground from uh, the depth of field. She has a veil. And she like pivot on one foot, pushing on the ground with the other one. Um, once again, this is a veil dance, after all, where one only veil functions as a synecdoche for the Salome's seven veils, and Lame dances in front of the army to save the slave city, like Salome in demoralizing version staged by Fuller, danced in front of the Tetrarch for saving John the Baptist. So, Lame to save uh, city, the slave he loves, she loves, and the lawyer Fuller as Salome to save uh, John the Baptist from the Tetrarch. Um, the same choreographic element, so this in imperfected, imperf imperfected uh, pirouette, records also in the second dance scene of the movie, when Lame, taken prisoner in the Emmy's harem, performs a death dance enveloped in the coils of a snake, literally a, a real snake. Uh, nonetheless, this time, uh, the uh, geographic uh, boundaries uh, shift a little further. In fact, despite the Arabic set, the choreography has clear similarities with the Indian dance created by Rus and Dennis. Uh, in this regard, note that Lakme, or Lame, was also the main character of the opera orchestrated by Leo Delib, uh, Lakme in 1883, whose score Saint Dennis used for the Cobras, one of the two prologue dances for the representation of her famous show Rada during the matinee held at Hudson Theatre in New York on the 22nd of March 1906. Um, Ruth and Dennis, uh, uh, just a few lines about her, had a self-taught education concerning dance artism. Then she found the union between dance and a spiritual dimension that she was looking for in the fanciful orient, uh, well defined by uh, Edward Said. This exoticism was the reference model for creating the utopia of an occidental uh, religious dance, the leitmotiv of her whole artistic career. Uh, actually, St. Dennis really approached the Orient uh, only in 1925 during the Asian tour of the Danish Show Dance Company. Before that moment, her knowledge of Eastern dances was based on the information incomplete and inaccurate inferred from literature and visual arts. Her solos depicted the image of a dance, dancer priestess uh, engaged in esoteric rites and uh, uh, played by herself. India before and Egypt after were the favorite set of her shows. And as you can see from the picture on your right, um, the pico skirt was uh, one, of the, um, one of the pictures uh, uh, drawn by Aubrey Beasley for the English uh, uh, edition in 1894 of Salome by Oscar Wilde. And uh, Ruth and Dennis also staged uh, um, um, a show entitled uh, The Legend of the Peacock, uh, wearing uh, a, a costume uh, uh, really similar to, to Aubrey Beasley's um, picture. The solo of the cobras included a wave-like motion of the arms as an icon transla iconic translation of two fictitious snakes. This gesture was a clear example of the succession, um, succession successions, I mean, wave-like movements ideated by Francois del Sartre in his uh, famous theory of movement. Considering the exhaustive definition of del Sartre's succession given by Ted Schoen, uh, the repeated gesture of the arms performed by Gianna Terribili Gonzalez in Il Fiore del Deserto are quite similar to the wave-like movements uh, described for the cobras. The presence of the snake only suggested in the cobras becomes concrete in Il Fiore del Deserto, and as well as the cobras virtually launched an attack against the public at the end of St. Denis' choreography, similarly in this movie the dance ends up ends with the mortal bite of the snake to Lame. Likewise, the flute, one of the music instruments really present in uh, the Libs Lame um, Partitu, uh, which accompanied the cobras, becomes a physical presence in Il Fiore del Deserto. So later she dances with the flute. Uh, so that is listed to wonder uh, if the same score was employed as accompaniment uh, for the movie screening or perhaps even on the set during the filming of the death dance sequence. 
Similarly to Rada, a fanciful combination of ballet steps, pour de bras, tendu, passé, développé, and oriental-like movements imbued with the saltism, um, e.g. the sweats drawn by the arms, uh, the jump-like steps, the tone performed by pivoting on one foot and pushing on the ground with the other, also constituted the choreography performed by Gianna Terribili Gonzalez in Il Fiore del Deserto, um, barefoot as well as Ruth and Dennis in Rada. Uh, moreover, among the poses of Rada, there were some particularly significant derived from the classic iconography of South Indian temples, where are portrayed various karana, the motion units of the Indian dance. And the uh, description of uh, the dance of smell perfectly, uh, of Ruth and Dennis, perfectly fits also for the pose repeated by Gianna Terribili Gonzalez. So, um, this, what, I, what I mean is that the second dancing of Il Fiore del Deserto incoherently presents an Indian inspired choreography, inspired by Ruth and Dennis uh, imagery, uh, inside the Middle East uh, uh, set, once again confirming the superficial knowledge of the Orient diffused, diffused uh, in Occidental countries. Uh, now there is this movie, uh, Come una sorella. Um, I'll try to summarize. Uh, um, um, this is a movie um, directed by Vincent uh, Vincent Denisot, uh, which was uh, a French uh, uh, epate director who then worked for Itala Film. And in, in 1912, he uh, directed this movie in, in which uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, main character, um, a, a dancer, uh, Nelly, played by Lydia Quaranta, a famous actress of that time in silent, Italian silent cinema. And she um, plays uh, this uh, dance inside the scene, which is set uh, in, inside the theater. So uh, the theater is entitled uh, the Alhambra. Uh, presumably, it was the London Alhambra Theater, which was very famous at the turn of the century until uh, well, uh, later in the in, uh, um, 20th century. Alhambra Theater, the name, recalls um, a Spanish set uh, with Arab uh, um, buildings, so uh, I mean the palace in, in Granada. So um, this uh, uh, dance presents the same uh, kind of imperfect pirouette with the uh, turn played, uh, uh, performed on one uh, foot and pushing on the ground with the other one. And that is inside a Spanish Arab set, uh, which is in, um, in uh, London. So. It's a kind of uh, Western version of Orientalist dance, uh, presenting always the same choreographic element. And uh, uh, this, um, um, this uh, uh, element uh, also uh, recalls this choreographic element in another movie, which is uh, L'Invidia. Uh, and this is, uh, this is amazing, I would like to, <laughs> to show, but Anyway, these pictures uh, already says, uh, uh, say what I want to do. So um, the, um, the, this is Limbidia, where there are two different dances. The main character is, per, is played by uh, Francesca Bertini, as you know, the main diva of Italian silent cinema. And uh, Francesca Bertini here plays uh, um, the role of a dancer. She, uh, in the first dance scene, um, um, uh, these are the um, images, um, she, she wears a, a kind of a Greece, uh, Greek tunic. Uh, you can see the meander pattern on the, um, um, on the skirt. And uh, uh, she dances with these uh, statuesque uh, uh, poses. Uh, so it seems like she wanted to um, recover the uh, Isadora Duncan um, modern dance uh, concept. And uh, um, um, up on your right, you can see um, the second dance scene where she dances uh, with <coughs> a very different um, very different costume, which recalls the one uh, um, the one uh, worn by um, Lida Borelli in uh, the, in uh, her theatrical Salome, and also in many other silent movies. And uh, she plays these poses, which reminds of. Um, uh, Egypt uh, um, bas reliefs and, and uh, iconography. So, um, like uh, Ruth and Dennis uh, um, 
Egypt inspired dances. Uh, so in two different scenes inside the same movie, the same element, a choreographic element, this uh, um, kind of uh, uh, imperfect pirouette, um, it records in two different kind of orient, I mean Greece, a kind of uh, tamed orient for the Mediterranean people, and on the other side we find Egypt. So. Um, um, in another kind, totally another kind of um, uh, orient, and uh, uh, the same element. I mean, the same element where you can find it uh, as an oriental dance uh, in different types of orient. Um, so, um, I jump to the conclusion. Um, first of all, the costumes clarify the choreographic and geographic reference scope as a uniform that state the identity of the following dance. Especially the veil, a fetish of Eastern seduction, returns as an essential choreographic object from ancient Greece to Middle East and India, thus confirming, as Nicola Savarese says about uh, theater history, uh, the Western tradition whereby the way of dressing the outward appearances, that is precisely the meaning of the Latin word habitum, has been constituting the easiest way to know the others without any need to deepen the knowledge of further cultural issues. The reason of this superficial information, first of all, must be found in the fear of the others, highlighted by Said. Not by chance, the Orientalist cinematic choreographic imagery, um, even when it goes up to India, it never really leaves the Mediterranean shores. Concerning specifically the choreography, the term performed by the dancer on both her feet by rhythmic steps, a kind of imperfect pirouette, sometimes accomplished pivoting on one foot and repeatedly pushing on the ground with the other, um, recalls uh, invariably in almost every one of the scenes here discussed, in spite of the various geographical boundaries suggested by settings and or by the costumes. Clearly, this is a choreographic topos, a cliche rooted in the coeval limited knowledge of the Orient. A bit because of ignorance and a bit because of the ability of the art for standing super partes, Italian silent cinema through dance describes a foggy geography which from Italy to North Africa, um, from Greece to the Arabian Peninsula, and even up to India emerges distant and often antithetical cultures in the waters of the Mediterranean seas. Okay. <laughs>
In Philosophy in the Flesh, Lakoff argues that what is important is not just what we have, that, that we have bodies and that thought is somehow embodied. What is important is that the peculiar nature of our bodies shapes our very possibilities for conceptualization and categorization. If Kant knew that. Uh, the immediate epistemological consequence of this uh, multidirection relationship is that senses are essential in learning and acting in the world. Therefore, participating in the construction of anyone's identity and self-consciousness. Lakoff speaks of embodied concepts, which are a narrow structure that is actually part of or makes use of the sensory motor system of our brains. In other words, we think with our senses and we feel with our mind. Our faculty of understanding is based on a complex intricacy of neurons and nerves, on a multidirectional networking of electrical impulses, blood vessels, dendrites, synapses. Our mind is but a part of our cognitive metabolism because there will be no understanding without a body that hears, sees, smells, tastes, and so on. Furthermore, the body is but a part of, of greater natural metabolisms that supply the materials for any sensorial perception to happen. It is through this, it's this per, uh, perpetual movement that we actualize our consciousness. What is important is not just that we have bodies and that thought is somehow embodied, but that the peculiar nature of our bodies shape our very possibilities for conceptualization and categorization. When our senses receive their inputs from the environment, being it social or natural, the outcome of this, of this becoming brings to light further epistemological implications. Uh, here is uh, again Lakoff, he says, the embodiment of reason via the sensory motor system is of great importance. It is a crucial part of the explanation of why it is possible for our concept to fit so well with the way we function in, in the world. They fit so well because they have evolved from our sensory motor systems, which have in turn evolved to allow us to function well in our physical environment. Talking about uh, Darwin. In brain and culture, uh, Bruce uh, Brexler, uh, which is another ne neuroscientist. This is a neuroscientist, well, like office philosopher of mind. In brain and culture, Bruce Brexler shows how scientific research strongly suggests the interconnected nature of sensation, thought, and the environment. The, uh, it's a very nice quote. The relationship between the individual and the environment is so extensive that it, it almost overstates the distinction between the two to speak of a relationship after all. The body is in a constant process of gas, fluid, and nutrient exchange with the environment, and the defining feature of each body organ is, is its role in the process. The brain and its sensory processes are no exception. Becoming, becoming aware of this material and physical process can indeed initiate a different personal and relational understanding. In fact, these components indeed precede any historical or social relationship, any specific actualization, as the color precedes the painting and, or the stone precedes the sculpture. This determination needs to be realized through a cleansing process by which a phenomenological shared platform is identified and analyzed, analyzed, being aware that superficial generalization, of course, can be a significant risk. Nonetheless, this is worth exploring because our cognitive history is also a sensorial and environmental history. For Aristotle, vision and sound represented the most refined human senses because they allowed the human animal to develop the aesthetic appreciation of beauty. In contemporary societies, visual culture maintains a prominence over sonic culture due to a manifold of different historical reasons. The deluge of visual images that are presented to us in every minute of our existence pushes auditory culture to a secondary role. However, while well, nowadays the visual nature of our social memories allows us to easily recognize the role of vision in this process, the role of sound often appears as less important or auxiliary at best. Auditory perception are as important as visual ones. Even complex conceptual uh, cognitive levels, such as space and time, have in fact an auditory construction. The movement of sound in space makes us aware of the spatial qualities of our environment. It tells us the location of objects and their physical qualities. In terms of time, the inescapable rhythm of our heartbeat, our breathing, shows how being conscious of our own existence is connected to sound. The becoming of our life and the qualities of the external world is revealed through sound. Moreover, it has been shown that environmental sounds are closely related with verbal memory. 
meaning that even language, the most complex and the most human of human capabilities, has environmental connotations. Even if we may not be aware of it, our cognitive evolution interprets and processes memories with the help of the sounds that pervade our everyday life. The famous American author and political activist, who after a terrible illness became deaf and blind in her childhood, say that uh, of the two, she missed hearing the most. Because in her words, blindness separates people from things, while deafness separates people from people. And here, um, there is uh, this um, Baldwin who wrote, wrote this, uh, he's another neuroscientist who wrote this auditory cognition in human performance. And it says, in the human brain in conjunction with the ear has evolved in such a way that it enables humans to organize and interpret the complex array of sounds heard in everyday life. Remarkably, we are, we are able to simultaneously segregate multiple sources of sounds into their individual units while combining individual components of each sound stream into meaningful holes. Natural sounds are given without any mediation, which is another reason why they are very important in determining a metacultural common identity. Natural sounds play a, a crucial role in the formation of memories within all people who experience and share the same natural environment. Moreover, memories represent the very structure in which self-identity is actualized and becomes. From this follows that if a cohesive environment is shared, a common identi identity which is based on that environment is possible. Plus, since many degrees that a shared Mediterranean natural environment, uh, since many agree, sorry, that a shared uh, Mediterranean natural environment actually exists, that there must be a shared Mediterranean identity based on this element. More so, if sounds plays an important role in the determination of this natural environment, it can be deduced that a Mediterranean community based on its auditory panorama exists. These sounds become important elements that being shared by the majority of the inhabitants of the Mediterranean region can re uh, really create a common platform for a renewed Mediterranean aggregate. I was born and raised among the western Italian side of the Mediterranean Sea. I have breathed into its salty waters, I was warm along its shores, I've experienced its sunsets and its sunrises, I've loved and hated it, but never imagined that I would uh, have intentionally departed from it. When, uh, when I moved to the east coast of the United States, gradually in time, after appreciating many great and exciting, many great and exciting sides of the American reality, I started to experience a feeling of uneasiness. Eventually, this feeling became a sort of underlying anxiety, which in turn made me feel unsettled. The positive feelings I had toward my new place were at times overpowered by a sense of frustration toward it. I felt that the ways in which people socially brought themselves would always eventually mismatch mine, that I had to rediscuss my entire identity, it's, it's my, uh, my cultural and social character, and even the way I physically relate to the surroundings. Eventually, these elements were smoothed through uh, communication and compromise, through cultural hybridization, which made me reappreciate my new home and reassert my identity organically within my new environment. This becoming made, made the anxiety and uneasiness gradually dissipate in time, However, a new element started to emerge, a new unresolved contradiction revealed itself. This time, this new emotional discrepancy was not a source of anxiety, but of a malaise. There was something missing, expressively the very fact that my new home mismatched the natural phenomenology of my birthplace. Because contrary to social displacement, no compromise was possible. No process of synthesis could resolve the dialectics of emotions. It was practically impossible a reconciliation between my natural environment and the new one. It was, impossible, uh, it was an impossible operation to bring the Mediterranean on the shore of the Atlantic Ocean, even if I wanted. The colors, the smells, the sounds, the fauna, the vegetation were different, and perceiving my body in the new environment was, to a certain degree, cause, cause of distress. What I was missing were the features of, of my na native ecosystem, I fantasized of the entire sapphire and clear emerald colors of its waters, the celestial clarity of its sky, the resilience of the Macchia Mediterranea, the restoring shadow of the maritime pines, the myrtle, the juniper, the rocks crawling into the sea. Be beside the sound of the wave breaking on the rock or the sounds of urban life, which are non-place-specific sounds anymore, there is a specific shared sonic phenomenology that is presented to all Mediterraneans. In Italy, 
I used to wake up in the morning to the sounds of swallows and swifts, whose presence made me feel on their arrival, the beginning of spring, and on their departure, the end of the summer, the incoming of the winter. The symphonic singing of the cicadas in the middle of the day reminded me of the stuffiness of a hot summer afternoon. The incessant morning chant of the house sparrow in the winter announced a sunny day and a lazy dusk. Becoming aware of this lost dimension and ultimately being able to share with it with my fellow Mediterraneans represented the internal process which compelled me to pursue a sonic project that would have, its, as it seemed, universal belonging to a Mediterranean sonic phenomenology. Those sauna found, uh, sounds I just described, which may not singularly belong to the Mediterranean region only, are in fact uniquely Mediterranean when they are presented simultaneously. In fact, the sparrow is native of the Mediterranean region, Europe, and part of Asia. Cicadas are largely diffused around the world, but they prefer the Mediterranean climate and its vegetation, especially pine and olive trees. Swallows and common sweets uh, live be between the Mediterranean area, most of, uh, sorry, Mediterranean area, most of Europe and the Near East in the summer, while they migrate to the south of the African continent in the winter. In one of Aesop's fables, it is narrated how the friendship between men and swallows started. The bird, the, the bird line was starting to germinate as the swallow, realizing the, realizing the danger, warned the other birds. It summoned all the birds and advised them to cut all the trees that produced bird lime and suggested to ask men to be spared in case they could not eliminate the trees. All birds started to ridicule the swallow because what he was saying, they were thinking that what he was saying was absurd. After this, though, the swallow went herself to men and implored them to spare them. Thanks to its, to its intelligence, men agreed to protect the swallows, allowing them to live among them. This is why while men hunt all other birds, the swallow is not only spared, but can use their houses for nesting. The common swift, swift has not uh, had the recognition it deserves because easily it's confused with the swallow, even if they, are, they belong to different species of birds. Moreover, they are, with their stridule and acute sounds, the loudest birds in the Mediterranean summer. The sparrows were often associated with the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the reason seems to be the fact that they were considered lustful creatures. And, and not only, but the house sparrow was also representing an ancient Egyptian art, especially in, in a hieroglyphic. Uh, uh, the one with based on them means something small, just to consider the small. In addition, this man had the task after their death to refer to the muses who honored them and who did not. So I'm gonna play uh, some of these birds. Here we have the old sparrow. Probably you hear it every day. This is the common bird you see every day here. Uh. Here's the cicada. Who's the summer didn't hear this? I mean, I don't know the volume. Here's a swallow. And here is the common swift, which actually, if you remember in every Italian summer, if you watch movies, Italian movies about Italy with the summer, you always hear this. And these are uh, the, the Swifts, which are all black and bigger. And they don't, they don't uh, nest, uh, they nest in the holes in the house. They don't nest, um, they don't build the nest under the... Now, the project uh, was, let's put that all together. Let's make a rhythmical part out of it. And then let's make some music on it. Um, so, this was the idea initial. So um, what I did, I, did, I, I, I recorded this, I put it together, and, um, and then I presented to different friends of mine that were musicians. Uh, there was this uh, very old friend of mine which we were playing together when we were 19, and now he has a recording studio in Calabria. And I gave it to him and said, oh, I didn't think about that. 
It's that's because, you know, once you leave, you, your memory actually made you remember better than when you were in the place. Uh, so, um, so this is the reading of part. And so it, it was, we, uh, we have been in this project called Arch Archipelago, in which every piece is an island, an imaginary island of an archipelago. Um, in this case, I would present the first one. The, uh, the rest is still in, uh, in itinerary, and uh, we actually tried to find also some found to do it, because between the uh, United States and Italy, it's a bit difficult. Um, okay. I'm not going to translate it in English. Today I'm going to show some photographs that I've made uh, as well as read kind of a narrative, uh, not, not quite give a paper, um, but more read, oh can I actually have the lights, thank you, um, read some narratives that are, that are happening behind these images. Um, so, so a voice is heard echoing uh, is basically documenting multiple narratives uh, involving the creation and preservation of Neolithic temples, objects, uh, sites, and also mythological sites in Malta. 
through photographic diptychs. Uh, so many of the legends that are portrayed in the country's two archaeology museums revolve around female figures. So one story goes that uh, the structure Gigantia was built by a giantess named Sansana uh, who lugged boulders on her back while breastfeeding a baby and eating honey. Uh, some believe that the site was once used by a matriarchal society for worshiping a fertility goddess. Um, before a new influx of peoples came and instilled a, a patriarchal order. Uh, so many modern archaeologists are less keen to kind of make such a gendered specific claim about the purpose of this place and others like it, uh, instead acknowledging that while such a space, such spaces do indicate some kind of religious worship, uh, there's no proof of that worship being grounded in the veneration of a divine feminine power. Uh, so the photographs in this series, uh, and this is sort of just a, this is actually another work that I made for a show uh, photo in Photoshop of the touristic kind of souvenirs of these female figures. Um, but the photographs in the rest of the series invite a viewer to see double, uh, to visually process two discursive positions or separate moments in time to simultaneously gather contradictory interpretations of prehistory. Gigantia was made by a matronly goddess, or no, it was made by Le Corbusier's brother across time. The figures found in and around Neolithic sites in Malta are obviously female, or no, they are not. Photographs of Malta and its sister island, Gozo, along with images of other mythological and religious figures associated with the islands, like Calypso, Pandora, and Mary, uh, populate the series. As there's no written record, or much material context to explain the function of prehistoric architecture and artifacts. Um, the analysis of prehistoric art is often speculative uh, and essentially, or especially reveals the values of the contemporary researcher or looker. Uh, therefore, I frame mirrors, screens, and display cases alongside the wider environments that have uh, held travelers looking for knowledge and pleasure in prehistory revealing patterns, signifiers of femininity in my visual chronicle. Uh, so this character uh, that narrates a journey to Malta is, uh, that you'll hear um, as I show the photographs, is looking to connect with an alleged goddess uh, in a patriarchal yet allegedly post-feminist world. Uh, so she's a, an American tourist who thinks herself a sort of pilgrim but runs into various diversions that thwart her spiritual enlightenment. So I owe a lot of my inspiration for this project to feminist anthropologist Catherine Roundtree, uh, who researches the goddess movement and, and tourist slash pilgrims connection to local populations and preservation of heritage sites. Uh, she writes, quoting Dean McCannell, if as McCannell says, the tourist is really an early postmodern figure, alienated but seeking fulfillment in his own alienation, nomadic, placeless, a kind of subjectivity without a spirit. I would suggest that the goddess pilgrim is similarly a postmodern figure, alienated from many of modern society's values, collecting a plethora of deities, myths, rituals, and sacred sites from the world's religious traditions, a kind of subjectivity with abundance rather than absence of spirit. Sharing the middle class Taurus attraction to heritage, goddess pilgrims are part of what Edgar terms the era of pastiche and nostalgia. However, I do not think that goddess pilgrims can be described accurately as post-tourists, those who acknowledge the staged authenticity of many traditional tourist attractions but delight in them nonetheless, knowing that there is no authentic tourist experience. The devotees of goddess spirituality may readily admit uh, that their modern paganism involves much borrowing and pastiche, but they are deeply serious about their belief in the sacred energy connected with ancient pagan temple sites and equally serious about their experiences of this energy. So uh, with, with that kind of introduction, um, I'm going to show basically the series kind of flickers in between um, images whenever there's a black and white uh, image. And oh, it's very, really kind of pixelated, huh? Um, it's strange. OK, well, they look better on my screen. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, uh, so it'll flicker in between kind of text that describes like a museum, uh, a museum text. It's, oh, it's, something's happening with the 
projector error maybe. Um, but anyway, so this says, uh, is this an accurate representation here? And it shows uh, an image, computer-generated image of a woman uh, that they're finding from this skull. Uh, and then on the right is a poem um, by uh, a, a poet named um, Pisani uh, called Gigantia. And um, so basically one of the stanzas goes, you know, it's about this maiden who has to die for Malta um, for, um, for the, the community to continue flourishing. So she's this blonde, um, pale woman who comes and says, ah, I will die for Malta so that the, the, um, the community continues to flourish. So it'll flicker in between these, uh, these things. So you book a place on Airbnb. The listing says, sleep in an ancient farmhouse, drink smoothies every morning made from local organic fruit, benefit from Helena's Reiki, feel the power of the goddess and the restorative cliffs blossoming with time. As you wait for the plane in Dayton, Ohio, drinking what is not a locally sourced smoothie, the drone of CNN, I'll reveal a little bit when this was written here, <laughs> comes into sharp focus with the words shooting and Planned Parenthood. Colorado snow falling on the TV screen cut through with the lights of an ambulance panning camera. Don Lemon is saying investigators are still trying to figure out the shooter's motive. Just three days previous, you'd gone to Planned Parenthood to get your annual checkup, and there had been protesters outside the door looking at you as if you were lecherous, unclean, deserving of death. You think, I know this asshole's motive. Give me Helena's Reiki, give me bountiful blended fruits, give me the goddess, get me out of here. Image from, uh, from the museums, this is showing a, a figure called the Sleeping Lady found in a, a, what's called the Hypogeum, an underground structure made about uh, 3000 BC, uh, or two, yeah, 3000 BC. Um, and so this reads, <laughs> This unique creation represents a singular achievement in Maltese prehistoric art. This beautifully rendered figure of the reclining lady was discovered in the pit of one of the painted galleries of the House of Feni Hypogeum, offered, often hailed as a sleeping mother goddess in quotes. The figure may well be an eloquent represent, representation of death, capital D, or the eternal sleep. So this is one of the examples of a, a female figure in Malta's museum. Um, uh, according to the, the narrative here, representative of death, of the eternal sleep, quoting, uh, often hailed as the mother goddess. So this is a popular, talking about a popular interpretation of these sites, a, a folklore interpretation of these sites, um, setting it up against an archeological interpretation of, um, it might represent death, right? So you had read archaeologist Maria Gambutas, The Language of the Goddess, and then Civilization of the Goddess in your college anthropology class years ago, and had recently come across the books while moving to your new job in Indiana. She thought there were enormous differences between the old European system, which she considered woman-centric, and the Bronze Age Indo-European patriarchal culture which supplanted it. According to her interpretations, gynocentric societies were peaceful, honored women, and espoused economic equality. But then male-dominant Kurgan peoples invaded Europe and imposed upon its natives the hierarchical rule of male warriors. She also theorized that during this pre-patriarchal blissful utopia, a goddess representing the universe and the harmony between all the creatures and forces within it was venerated by different Neolithic cultures across Europe. She comes to this conclusion after years of compiling a glossary of pictorial motifs that emerge in sites and artifacts across Europe and the Mediterranean. In his introduction, the language of the goddess, and, sorry, in his introduction to the language of the goddess, Joseph Campbell writes, the religion in contrast, is in contrast to Genesis 3.19, where Adam is told by his father creator, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you will remain. Return. In this earlier mythology, the earth out of which all these creatures have been born is not dust, but alive, as the goddess creator herself. The, nine, the taxi driver tells you on the drive from the airport to your farmhouse cave. 
You'll see images of Our Lady Mary on the houses, postcards, doorknobs, everywhere. She shows you where you are. Now we are heading north. To the east are two Neolithic temples, Hagar Kim and Minadra. She speaks proudly about the Maltese language, a mix between Italian, Sicilian, French, English, Arabic. So another museum image. Uh, here another emphasis on a broken or destroyed um, figure. So fragments of this large stone figure found scattered over an area of seven meters, suggesting that the statuette could have been purposely thrown down from a certain height. Uh, this, as well as similar evidence from other megalithic temples, uh, poses a very interesting question. Why were these seemingly important representations being broken on purpose? <clears throat> so we're back uh, to uh, the Airbnb house now. Um, Helen is shining light or torch in Greek. Helen, daughter of Zeus and cause of the Trojan War. Saint Helen, mother of Constantine the Great, arbiter of Christianity in the Western world. Yelena has breakfast with you one day. She's a naturopath from Serbia and there's a delicate steadfastness about her. She says, in my work, I try to understand the cause of the disease by understanding the body, mind, and spirit of a person. There are often slight adjustments, slight realignments that can be made with no need for pills. Her British partner, uh, sh she tells you how she met her British partner, Peter, when he was doing conservation work in Nigeria, helping to preserve endangered wildlife. What we are doing to the earth is madness, she says. My mother used to tell me, to strike the earth is the same as striking your own mother. That reminds me, when you swim, watch for jellyfish. So here's a jellyfish uh, sting. Watch for jellyfish. They are multiplying like crazy in the Mediterranean because the turtles that usually eat them are becoming endangered. Uh, the conversation turns to romantic love. Breaking a piece in, of toast in half, she muses, we fall in love with lions, and then over the years, our love turns them into cats. Uh, when I met Peter, he was saving lives, and now he's saving the side of his boat in his harbor, a happy retired man. She says it tenderly and goes to work. You are alone now in their house, which is indeed cave-like, decorated with paintings and artifacts Peter collected from Nigeria. Fishing nets, bright model boats, masks meant to be used for ritual, now still hanging over a coffee table, now stilled hanging over a coffee table, cradling a remote control and a copy of Reading Auras, How to Redirect and Take Charge of Your Energy. On the stairwell, a framed Pandora opens her box. Earlier that morning, Yelena had Skyped with her daughter and her newborn granddaughter in Serbia. Now her laptop sits closed on the kitchen table. Her mouse pad features an image of Disney's Pocahontas, face frozen in the moment where she first sees John Smith in the waterfall. Because she is so beautiful, he falls in love with her and decides not to shoot her. So another image um, at the Archaeology Museum in Malta says, uh, model of a megalithic niche, rooted with, uh, sorry, rooted, roofed with seven slabs. Inside, two objects, probably phallic in intention, are carved, and at their base is a thick disc hollowed in the center. Four hollow holes have been drilled, two on the left side and two below the niche. Another image. Slabs of limestone painted in red ochre. They are carved with a pair of phalli in a rectangular niche. The base, has been pitted, the base has pitted decorations. It could be they were originally one artifact. So instead of an emphasis on brokenness or destruction, uh, why are these being broken on purpose, these phalli were probably one, right? These probably unified. So you set out for the day. Uh, you are going to Gigantia. In her chapter, The Power of Two, Gimbutas writes that the site exemplifies the twin aspect of the goddess, as the temple is built in anthropomorphic shapes meant to convey two female figures. One enters and is birthed from them. Uh, but something is wrong with your map reading skills. You are walking along a dry, rocky goat path. The August sun is showing off its might. Bees frantically pollinate the only herb still flowering, purple thyme. Its scent hangs in the air with no breeze to transfer it. The Mediterranean touches the base of the cliffs to your left, lapping imperceptibly. Small stones, millions of years old, um, flower, a 
You crunch beneath your feet. You stop and look around, um, looking for any sign of the road, uh, the human. You replay scenes from I shouldn't be alive in your head, thinking this is how it all starts, an innocent enough journey to find the mother goddess and take back the enlightenment you receive from her and share it with the peoples of your homeland so as to structurally alter the society in which deranged gunmen try to kill women in Planned Parenthood waiting rooms. You see your corpse stretched out in the sun, cupped hand about to dip into the last puddle in Gozo. Vultures pick at your bones, even the bees stop to see what they can get out of it. And you see your corpse then slumped in a couch in the clinic waiting room, the chipper teenage girl in the informative video playing overhead, blissfully unaware that you have departed this life, announcing, I finally decided it was time to take charge of my body. I just got a prescription for the pill, and I love it. No more worrying. You are walking in a jagged sort of spiral at this point. That's when you hear it, the heroic roar of an engine, heralding a red rectangle on wheels, the hop-on, hop-off Malta tour bus, hurtling itself over the crest of a nearby hill. The road, renewed, you make for it. It takes about 10 minutes scrabbling over rocks and brush, and you're there. A sign announces Calypso's Cave. Sure, why not, you think. Uh, the hop-on, hop-off bus is parked near the entrance to a footpath marked with yellow paint. Some tourists who have hopped off are following the path in a line. One with binoculars asks her partner, so is this where Ulysses actually landed? Beside the entrance to the path is a small wooden shop labeled with a handwritten sign, Calypso's Gifts. You go inside, hoping one of these gifts is water. You greet the bespeckled woman at the sales counter and scan the shelves loaded with trinkets, knights of Malta, figurines, plates, bottles of honey, um, miniature white, mostly headless ladies. They're labeled Venus of Malta, goddess of fertility, goddess of love, sleeping woman, fertility idol, sitting lady, fat lady. You pick up the Venus of Malta, recognizing it from Gimbutas. Um, the shop owner behind the counter notices your interests and remarks, these were used in fertility rituals in ancient times. There are little statues found in Neolithic temples, burial sites all across the Maltese islands. The replicas are very good. You're in luck because I'm having a sale right now. Buy seven and get one free. <laughs> she wraps the figures individually in paper with care uh, and get gestures to a small book on the counter, The Goddess of Malta by Dr. Veronica Veen. You look like you want to learn more, she says. <laughs> Dr. Veen published this independently. It tells a much different story than the official Marti Maltese archaeological texts. She proves that this area was once matriarchal and goddess worshiping. Usually the book is 20 euro, but I'll give it to you for 15. Salt. Calypso's cave, where Ulysses allegedly sought shelter for seven years and fell in love with the nymph who called it home, is a fenced off hole in the ground bracketed by rocky, graffitied rubble. You hear the great rumble of the bus engine, tires twisting and propelling the red rectangle to the next site. You peer into the slightly triangular yawning gap, trying to imagine the shipwrecked hero arriving here, dripping wet, welcomed into the arms of Calypso, who felt fed and sheltered him and made him swell with passion every night as he slowly grew guiltier and guiltier for cheating on, who was it? Helen of Troy, no. You walk back to the parking lot, searching the recesses of your memory for his wife's name, and notice that the shop door is closed and locked. You can just barely hear the shopkeeper listening to the radio and stirring liquid in a teacup, waiting to welcome the next hoppers on, hoppers off. Uh, so again, another um, pairing here. Uh, we have this n folklore narrative of a, a goddess, or a, a woman giantess, um, carrying large stones um, for Malta and Gozo, uh, carrying these stones on her head while also nursing a baby. Um, here, like Corbusier, uh, saying, oh yes, I, I visited these sites, um, part of, and this is kind of part of a tradition of the Grand Tour, um, visiting these sites, um, a little bit later than that, but he says, I did this. I gave life to a stone doorway like the one in my youth, uh, that man made, that made this door is my brother across time. So you have these multiple stories. Uh, the entrance to Gigantia is a museum. First, you are met with information and objects in a modern building that looks as if it were designed by Le Corbusier. 
The woman sitting behind the desk is reading inexplicably the language of the goddess. All of these stories are true, by the way. Um, you tell her you're reading it too, and you ask her what she thinks. She pauses, reaches down, and takes out another book on the archaeology of Gozo, written by the foremost Maltese archaeologists, and flips open to a page with two stone heads. Who is the head on the right, she asks. You say, it, it kind of looks like George Washington? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I asked so many people this question, and only Americans say George Washington. Yeah. This figure was found in the main entrance to Gigantia. We see what we want to see, what we have been taught to see. Nobody knows who these heads are. I'm an archaeologist, and I find so many faults with what Gimbutas is saying. She jumps to conclusions all the time, reads into symbols, relies on folklore way too often. And there was evidence of weapons in the era that she claims was peaceful and matriarchal. I have to say, a few years ago, I was guarding uh, the main site early in the morning before we had this new complex built. And I hear English voices approaching. They're women saying something about a goddess tour wanting to experience Chikantia as the sun rose. And I said, sorry, it's not open yet. And they looked so devastated as they turned away that I called out to them and said, okay, fine, come in. I'm not sure what happened to them in there, but when they left, they all looked so happy as so many foreigners have begun to come here in the past years, and they are usually like these women, looking for healing or something. Uh, it has brought money, a renewed effort of preservation in some cases. So we just built this new complex. <laughs> so fine, let people believe what they want, but still the facts, the evidence say nothing. Uh, you enter Gigantia's womb, and the first and last thing you see is George Washington. <laughs> so here he is. So here's a, a uh, you can't see that. Um, below it says this truck, it says, are you looking for signs? Um, on the side of it. And so here's the, here's the facade of Gigantia. Another, an image here of um, saying no graffiti. So there's a part uh, on, on the side of Gigantia's wall that has historical graffiti written into it, and there's a little sign that says, this is historical graffiti. Any uh, scratching of these prehistoric surfaces is strictly prohibited. Um, we reserve the right to uh, you know, prosecute you. And then on, kind of a, uh, on the side, there's somebody has written their taxi number here. Um, so another instance of, of this economic um, uh, using, using these sites. Um, uh, okay, so probably, maybe, so, uh, okay, very, almost done. <laughs> These are two, two displays in the Maltese uh, main archaeological museum uh, in Valletta. So here, this is labeled human figures, and then on the right is uh, phallic, uh, phallic representations, human representations and phallic representations. All sorts of, I mean, the, the semantic analysis you can do with the, the labels of these, like, many, multifold. Uh, so I'll just kind of flicker between these quickly. Uh, this is another instance, headless figurine of white alabaster with the left arm crossed over the abdomen. The back is concave. There is no clear representation of breasts. Right? And then you have these phallic representations images. This is Manajdra. A variety of clay and stone parts of human statues and sherds with human representations on them. While some have been found broken, others were made purposely to represent specific parts of a human body. An example of this is the row of twisted legs, which can be seen on the bottom right-hand corner. So this is a, these are zooms into the human representations Phallic symbols. Phallic symbolism reflects a number of concerns that were artistically represented by a number of stone and ceramic creations. Traditional interpretations link these symbolic representations with fertility rites. Or of particular interest is the grouping of phallic representations in the wall as a clear association of phalli with architect architectural features. Uh, so that's the only instance uh, where fertility, the word fertility occurs uh, in the, the museum in Valletta, 
is in association with the, the phallic symbols. So you have all of these female figures that are kind of dancing around. Ah, uh, she doesn't have breasts. Uh, it was destroyed. Um, and then you, and so, and here you have this label, the Venus of Malta, shown from the back. Also, the sleeping lady photograph shown from the back. Uh, the seated figurine from Tarjan, as well as the fragment from the Hypogeum, reflects a departure from conventional representations that followed established canons uh, with the use of more realistic compositions. And so, and it says, you know, this is a remarkable achievement of, of um, representation. Uh, in particular, the back of this figurine represents a very realistic rendering of anatomical features. So, um, some disjointedness here. Okay, uh, one, one more little thing. You are walking up a staircase decorated with round lights and valetta. You had taken the ferry to see the temples in Malta, Najdra and Hadrakim, and the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta, but hadn't found the goddess anywhere. Um, in fact, the museum had almost erased her completely. The stairway opens up into a cavernous room, and surrounding you are paintings of breasts, bellies, buttocks, corpulent, swirling figures highlighted with glitter. Arranged in diptychs, they comprise two abstract halves of a whole. Like the figurines in the archaeology museum, they come alive, formidable, creating their own galaxies, living in the space they delineated for themselves. Hello. The voice belongs to a woman hanging a picture of purple, glittery, breast-like uh, breast -like images across the gallery. Welcome. I'm Majda. This is my show. Have a look around. Thanks. Uh, this is beautiful work, you say and not in the way artists sometimes lie to each other for the sake of maintaining protocol at openings. The forms were masterful and sensual, a little ostentatious, loose, not quite finished, transforming into what they were to become, echoing but not imitating each other. Motifs of upended roots, spirals, cords appeared and disappeared in the soup of the canvases. You could breathe deeply while looking at them. Thank you. She sees your camera hanging around your neck. Uh, you're a photographer. It was beginning to get heavy, and you looked forward to putting it down for the day. You talked about being artists, the strange, rewarding processes, uh, the places those processes take you, to the edges of rationality and to the core of things, the love it takes to edge a work forward, the day jobs. She painted Christian allegories on the side of Maltese houses and taught high school. You worked in shoe stores and shoe strung together visiting professorships. The hope of transforming an idea into a gesture, the logic of a show comprised of what began as intuitive impulses. We just keep doing this, I guess, she says, and shrugs. We do. You sign her guest book, exchange cards, and tomorrow you will board a plane bound for your imperfect home. So that's my thoughts. <laughs>